unfortunately, the problem I see is even people like myself, you have a certain experience you grow up with, or you look to the suburban churches who've got this great big youth group, and you think I can just import those ideas with the same results, and I think you're kidding yourself. From Tri-State Bible College and the Appalachian Ministry Institute, this is the Level Paths Podcast. My name is Chris Weigel, and we're glad you've taken some time to join us. One way to tell if a church is healthy and vibrant and effectively reaching the community is by examining its youth ministry. If young people, especially before they move off to college, aren't exposed to God's Word during critical developmental years, the church is missing key evangelical and discipleship opportunities. The church is also aging demographically and not adding younger believers to the congregation. On this Level Paths podcast, Discipleship Methods in Rural Youth Ministry. How do churches in smaller communities with limited resources reach young people? Dr. Kyle Boone is the pastor at Hamden Congregational Church in Hamden, Ohio, and his studies have taken him down a path of observing and learning how to minister effectively in rural settings. Here's Rex Howe. Welcome to the Level Paths Podcast. My name is Rex Howe. I'm the president of Tri-State Bible College. I'm here with my partner, Dr. Matt Champlin, our Appalachian Research Fellow at the Bible College. Matt, how's today? Man, things are going well. We've wrapped up our Appalachian Ministry Conference, and now we're headed towards the summer. We've got several topics that we want to cover during the summer, and rural youth ministry is one of those topics, and so we're looking forward to today. That's right. Our conference was phenomenal. We're so appreciative for all who came out, and the feedback has been very helpful, both encouraging, but also going to help us for our planning for year three. So we're very, very grateful for that. We do want to make an announcement so that you can plan ahead for two things. Uh, First, we're going to have a Youth Worker World Cafe at Tri-State Bible College on Saturday, October 7th. And a World Cafe is an event where we have like focus groups and we ask questions and answer questions about youth ministry in Appalachia. And uh, we hope that if you're a youth worker, be that a volunteer youth worker or on staff at a church youth worker, we hope that you'll plan to join us at Tri-State Bible College on Saturday, October 7th. And save the date for our third annual Appalachian Ministry Conference that will be on April 23rd of 2024. We are here with a friend of mine. We've been friends for quite some time. His name is Pastor Kyle Boone. Kyle is the pastor of Hamden Congregational Church in Hamden, Ohio, way up there in the northeastern part of (laughs) Ohio. He told me a little bit ago that uh, all that's in Hamden is a gas station. That's right. He just finished his doctorate of ministry degree from Dallas Theological Seminary with a rural small town cohort with uh, his research primarily being in discipleship methods and rural youth ministry. I got to participate in some of the uh, focus group stuff that Kyle was doing about rural youth ministry. He has experience as a youth pastor. He was actually the youth pastor that followed me at Schofield Memorial Church down in Dallas, Texas. And then, of course, he's working with young people at Hamden as well as the senior pastor, but just love it on those families and discipling young people. So, Kyle... Welcome to the podcast. How are you today, brother? Good, good. It's good to be with you guys. Good to meet you, Matt. And uh, always excited to talk youth ministry. Why don't you tell us your story just a little bit more? I am from a small town. What's unique about the small town I grew up in Illinois is there was kind of three small towns of about 15,000 each that kind of converged. So you did have a decent sized population, but it was still very rural. And because of that, my church was abnormally large, even though it was in the middle of a cornfield. We got to be like 600 people at the church, 700 people. So youth ministry has been a big part of my life and traditional youth ministry at that. We had a youth ministry when I was in, it was kind of the heyday of it. We had about 80 kids in the youth group, in the high school youth group, not even including the middle school. So that's kind of my background in youth ministry. My life was transformed through it. I had an amazing youth pastor and went to camp, did the whole camp experience. That's where I felt the Lord called me into ministry. And it was a legitimate camp experience. I never came off the high, led several of my peers to Christ. We had a guys only high school Bible study going on. And we had like 40 kids getting together on a Thursday night, 
We had kids coming who didn't even know the books of the Bible. Uh, every week somebody was getting saved. I mean, it was incredible. So that's my whole background into it. When I went into seminary, I kind of got tricked into being a youth pastor because I wanted to go back to my home church. So I knew my youth pastor was going to be a senior pastor. So I studied youth ministry and they asked my dad if I wanted to be the youth pastor. He said, oh, no, he doesn't want to be the youth pastor. N- never asked me if I wanted to be the youth pastor. Well, gave the job to somebody else. I was filling in at Schofield Church where I was attending. Rex, you got the call to go to a pastor somewhere else. And they kind of told me, hey, you're studying youth ministry. You're working with the youth. You be the youth pastor. And so that kind of got me involved down that track before I am where I am today. So there's a lot we could talk about. Here's what I want to ask you next. And Matt, jump in here when you think of something. But we want to know a bit more about your research on uh, discipleship methods in rural youth ministry and connect that to what you see is missing in rural youth ministry. Mm-hmm. So I get hired at the church where I'm at. We wanted to go back to a small town in the Midwest. That's culture, home for us. It's familiar. It's the, the things we love. And I was partly hired because I had a background in youth ministry. And so I get there and the expectation is, all right, you're the guy, you're young, you're going to create a youth group and the kids are just going to flock. They're just going to show up and do this. Well, here I am. How, how do you start a youth group from scratch? Okay. You get up on the pulpit and you say, all right, next time we're having a youth group. And you know, guess what? Two kids show up. <laughs> uh, what do you do then? And so that was my experience. And I you know I had kind of the dilemma of people showing up to church and saying, oh man, the sermon was great. We love this church. Hey, what do you got for the teens? Oh, we have a youth group. We meet, you know, every other week because of volunteers and we only have two kids and then they move on. So you start feeling that pressure of how are we going to grow the church? How are we going to reach young families if we don't have a youth group and we only have a critical mass of two kids? And if they're not friends with the prospective church people coming in or if their ages are, you know, really diverse. And I know some churches like, oh, we got two sixth grade boys. Well, is the senior high girl really going to want to show up from the prospective family and go to youth group with the guys giggling in the corner about farts and, and whatnot? So how do you make that work? So my research on rural youth ministry, it was really kind of this crisis of what do you do? And the kind of thing I kept thinking about is there was all this talk in the air about, you know, we don't even need youth groups today and youth groups are the problem. But it really led to that first basic question of what are we trying to do? what is the purpose of youth ministry? What's the purpose of youth work? And so I think for me, that was what I started exploring. And the answer is so, so basic is that we are called to make disciples of all people. That includes youth, but we're called to make disciples of all people. And so what I saw that was missing in the youth ministry literature or or the stuff out there is just a freedom to do what needs to be done youth ministry or making disciples of youth is going to look so different from context to context. I was just sitting next to a, a, a Chinese uh, woman who was graduating with her doctorate and, you know, we're talking youth ministry and it's like, you know, do you have youth groups in China? Well, of course not. <laughs> the communist party is going to shut that down. So if youth group is the staple that you need to make disciples of youth, well, guess what? A lot of parts of the world don't have it. They can't. You got to have a culture that's friendly to Christianity to even have a youth group. So there's all these kind of contextual factors that go into it. And so what I just want to tell pastors is just make disciples, whatever makes sense, make disciples, figure out what you have to do biblically and then how you're going to do it. And I think when we start with those terms, there's a lot of freedom. that's going to look different from church to church, uh, especially rural church compared to a suburban church. And unfortunately, the problem I see is Even people like myself, you have a certain experience you grow up with, or you look to the suburban churches who've got this great big youth group, and you think, I can just import those ideas with the same results, and I think you're kidding yourself. You know, Kyle, when we think about youth ministry, I mean, the church existed for almost 2,000 years without a divided age-defined ministry. Mm -hmm. And I think that we could look at this, and we can say that for at least the first almost 1,800 years, we see growth and effectiveness, and then we start dividing ministries and in in many ways utilizing the techniques of the world in order to try to reach the world. And I think that there has been some modicum of success at first, but then we've seen this watered down. You pointed out the dilution of purpose. Mm -hmm. And so can you speak to the importance of the clarity of purpose in 
disciple ministry, whether it be for the youngest or for the oldest age, can you speak to how important it is to have that clarity of purpose in accomplishing the task that God's called us to in discipleship? One comment first on on what you said, I think it's important when you look at the history of Christendom that, yeah, you don't necessarily have that. But what you do have in Christendom is that we control the schools. (laughs) So we did have what if you want to call it, age segregated learning, but it was totally in a different context. So really youth ministry is the response to secularization in the West. And in many ways it serves a good purpose, but that's your whole point. What was the purpose of original youth ministry? And there's always been two prong emphasis in, in reaching teenagers, education and evangelism. And so am I evangelizing these kids or am I educating these kids? And of course there's an overlap between those two ideas. You got to teach them some things even to evangelize them. But I think that's the basic question is, what are we trying to do? Am I primarily reaching lost kids or am I primarily trying to disciple the youth of of church families? And your strategy is going to be different to both. A lot of the original outreaches that set the foundation for youth group in America were evangelistic. How do we get into the schools and reach these kids that aren't coming back to our churches? So we see some success there because a lot of people want to come because it's fun. It's this, it's that. But that doesn't necessarily work in making long-term disciples who know the word of God, who've been taught to obey everything that Christ has commanded. So, yeah, I think if you don't know exactly what you're trying to accomplish in a meeting, that that can go off real quick. I remember reading uh, When God Shows Up. That's kind of a history yeah. of youth ministry in America. And I, some of the things you're saying are starting. I haven't read about youth ministry in quite some time, but some things are starting to come back about why did youth ministry start in our culture? And it does have to do with sort of the exodus out of the school system. One of the things I've found fascinating about your work and previous conversations, Kyle, is this dynamic of a family oriented approach to discipling young people versus a more programmatic approach to discipling young people. Can you talk to us about the differences, pros and cons? in those two channels? Yeah. So I will say there is sort of a debate out there. You know, um, you'll have like the family integrated church people who they are totally anti any kind of age segregation. And that's their thing. I'm actually not that. What I do think is that families are the natural means by which we can reach kids because nobody loves their kids more than their parents and nobody spends more time with them than their parents. And so I think when we look at the history of disciple making, man, the influence of a parent is is hard to overcome. So kind of discipling mom and dad and teaching them it's your job to reach your kids. It's it. And that's a basic biblical injunction. You know, you can look at Ephesians and you can say, you know, raise them up in the admonition and the fear of the Lord. So that's kind of a bare bones basic. The problem I think is, well, who's coming to church? In my context, I don't know if I can do that. We have a girl who her mom doesn't come to church. Her, she doesn't know who her dad is, and she kind of comes to church with grandma. We have others where it's, you know, mom's a Christian, dad's not a Christian, dad's a Christian, mom's not a Christian. We have one who lives again with grandparents, one who just wants to get out of the house and comes to church. So I think family ministry is really effective when you have solid families. I don't think anything can be a mom and dad who loves Jesus and loves their kids. You can't compare with it. That's the natural way God's designed the world. At the same time, what do we do, especially in a society that's increasing with young people who are coming from broken families or even from the get go, mom and dad just don't even believe in marriage. My neighbors across the street, they don't believe in marriage. They've been living together for 20 years. But they don't believe in marriage. And so we got this whole dynamic, I think, about to rise up in our culture of how do we reach all these kids? So I'm not against family ministry. My big question is, who do you have at your church? Who are the people you're trying to reach? Now, if you've got Christian families at your church, the best way to reach those kids is have mom and dad <laughs> shoulder the heavy burden. I mean, help them out, support the family, but it really depends who you have coming to your church. So, Kyle, how do you bridge that gap then if youth ministry serves both a discipling role and also the evangelistic role? Then how do you bridge the gap and I've reached the student and I'm discipling this student. Now I'm going to expand that and try to bridge the gap and try to reach the family. How do you reach out like that and try to engage the family? Boy, I don't know. That's a million dollar question. <laughs> um, hopefully the change life of the student makes a big difference in their family. But I think it's, it's almost like any other person, you know, hopefully you reach them and you so profoundly impact their life that others around them can see their good works and they glorify their father who's in heaven. And so 
that's one way. I mean, you can be intentional into trying to have events or bridge events to bring family members in and things like that. But yeah, I would say that would be my biggest suggestion is hopefully that person can change those closest to them. In my own life, it was a youth pastor uh, who reached out to me. And from that, it impacted my family. And from that, it's impacted multiple families. But he did not take the approach. I mean, there were goofy kid things, you know, but he did not take the approach of our time was to get together and hang out and have pizza. He took the approach of, yeah, we're going to get together, hang out, have pizza, and he's going to teach us the Bible. And that had a profound effect because it's only scripture that has that promise that God's word will go forth and it won't return void. It'll accomplish what he sent it to accomplish. So what would you say is the difference between kind of the mega youth ministry? That's the, a lot of the writings, the mega youth ministry. That's what makes the conferences and the rural youth ministry. I think, again, it comes down to how do you start your approach to what you're doing? Do you start with the people or do you start with the systems? In a bigger church, you almost have to start with the systems. There are too many people. You can't individualize a ministry. A lot of writing says, you know, larger groups behave more predictably than smaller groups. And I think that's totally true. So in that case, you can have the best kind of, here's how we're going to do our curriculum, Genesis to Revelation, and we're going to touch systematics, and here's our apologetics, and we got teachers and we can staff it. And honestly, the large churches should do that. And they should do it with excellence. And I praise God for them. But you can't do that in a small town church. You don't know who you have, what their family background's from, and what you're going to deal with. And that's where you want to go from an individual level. Here's the kids that I got. I always did use the analogy when I was teaching the seminar. It's like a a new football coach to a new team. Do you run the offense you love or do you run the offense with the players you got? Yeah, you might want to run spread offense, but guess what? you got the Iowa Hawkeyes. You better run, you know. Iowa Hawkeye football, you can't just change it overnight. Now you might recruit, you might change players, you might get them to where they can go, but you got to run the offense with what's the players you have. So when I think about who is coming, are they saved already? Are they not saved? Are they mature? Are they high school students? Are they squirrely middle school boys? What am I dealing with? And then make your program from there. I love that. Actually, I just did a devotional Nehemiah three, which is just almost just a list of names. It's the remnant of people who rebuilt the wall. And you've got people like Hananiah, the perfumer working on one of the gates. It's like, this was not, this was not his. It's not my spiritual gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. But he's doing the work, right? Doing the work. Let me ask this, Kyle. And there's some way in which the the issues are the same, whether you're in an urban setting or in a rural setting. Uh, The internet has in some sense like old issues so that everywhere and every place you're experiencing a lot of the sameness, but I still think there are unique features in both urban and rural contexts. So in rural contexts with youth, with families, with leadership, what are some of the issues that you see particularly challenging to youth in rural contexts today? You know, that last one you brought up is interesting because the internet is a great level playing field for the younger generations, but sometimes for the older generations, it isn't. So you have this weird dichotomy in the church. Let's be honest. Most churches in a rural area have strong conservative political ties. So in church, we've had this happen, you know, like the typical, whatever, we don't have to worry about race issues or homosexual issues here and the environment. And that'll be the rhetoric from the parents and nobody will say anything. But when you get those kids in a back room, well, I've got friends who are gay. Well, I think Black Lives Matter is a good organization. I think we need to do more, we'll get rid of guns. I think we need to do more for the environment. And so I'm not to say, you know, I've got my persuasion on these. I'm not saying you have to take their side on things. What I'm saying is you need to have those conversations because just because they're silent about it doesn't mean they agree with you. And I think a lot of the church just thinks we're all in this echo chamber, but they are getting exposed on TikTok or Instagram or wherever they're at to a whole bunch of other ideas and views that I don't think the church is aware of. And so your cliches aren't working on them. You really need to engage them on a deeper level to answer their critiques and be aware of them. That I would say is one issue. Kyle, I think that's insightful. And I love that phrase, your cliches are not necessarily working on them. I think that's a helpful (laughs) phrase because that pretty much sums up rural ministry and maybe church ministry for the past 30 years that we've gone through this transition 
And I think that the access to the internet, the access to preaching, and the access also to really what we can say is indoctrination from the wider world, we're no longer shut off. Even in the rural world, we're no longer shut off because we have access right from our phones, and especially our students and our children have access right from our phones to the whole world. I remember in my lifetime, I'm 45 years old, I remember going to my grandparents' house and they had a party line, didn't have cable television. I remember not having cable television until later, it wasn't even available. And if you got it, you still got the same three <laughs> channels that you had otherwise. And so really in the rural context, we were shut off from the rest of the world. But with the advent of the internet, that changed everything. I don't need to go to the library to look something up anymore or to go to the Funk and Wagnall encyclopedia set. You know, now I can pick it up from my phone. And these kids are being indoctrinated in ways, in saturated in ways that we didn't don't even know. And so the cliches don't really answer the incredible questions. And so that really brings me to a thought. What has changed in student ministry and youth ministry in the past 20 years? I know that's a big question, but just kind of some snapshots. I don't even know if I'm qualified to answer that question. I, what I would say, though, is when I think about how we're addressing some of these cliches, because the one thing that we could all agree on is the whole mental health side of things is really escalated. And I think almost everybody, including technology makers, ascribe it to technology. When you read the generational books, the, they mark off a whole new generation, starting with the advent of the iPhone. That has been the game changer because people have this whole social identity. But going back to the idea of the disparity between the parents and the youth in rural areas because of what they're exposed to, you need to have conversations and, and actually realize where your kids are at. There'll be these YouTube videos out there exposing how, oh, can you believe these college kids actually don't believe in absolute truth? And this is crazy. Well, guess what? I sat down with our kids and we watched some video kind of like that. And they were mimicking, you know, I agree with what you said, whatever you believe about God is true. And so then it's like, we got to have that conversation. So then I'm like, well, you know, tell me what you mean. And getting them to articulate their faith, because you don't know what they believe until it comes out of their mouth. Get them to express it and then challenge it, you know. So we had to have that conversation the other day. And really what they got down to is they, they were tired of people being judgmental and mean, which I affirmed in them. But at the same time, that the truth is objective and that it's a knife in which things fall by the wayside. And so you would never have known that if you hadn't had that conversation with them. Let's focus on this for just a bit, Kyle. How is a rural setting uh, uniquely positioned, you know, thinking about opportunities, strengths mm -hmm. of a rural setting to disciple young people? I actually think the rural church has three really great strengths, unique that you wouldn't have in a big mega church. The first is the obvious, it's intimacy. You just know students. You can know them on a personal level. So that's huge. When you think about even what you need to be a disciple, you need two things. You need, you need intimacy, being known, as well as the information that comes from the spiritual gifts. So the mega churches, man, they've got great teaching and great worship and great spiritual gifts. But what they often struggle with is intimacy. That's why they have to do all the whole small group thing. Well, guess what? In the rural church, we've got the intimacy. It's just there. So, I mean, I know every teenager by name in my church and I can go to their ball games. I can spend time with them. You know, they don't get to know their pastor that way in the mega church. You know, for example, I've got a kid right now. He lives in the house behind me and I kind of leave the garage open for him. I got a weight room in there and he just goes up whenever he wants to and he works out and we can talk and have casual conversations whenever I see him in there. And so it's just a very good way. I, there's other times where ministry for me has looked like, you know, a student ran away from home. Well, guess who gets called to go out and look for him? You know, uh, I get called out to go look for him when parents are struggling with LGBTQ stuff and, and their kids. Well, I get called to do counseling with them. There's some students where I'm the one who has to go pick them up and give them a ride to church. So again, it's that intimacy of just knowing them on the familiar level. They see you in your regular life. They know how you treat your wife. They know how you, if you go golfing with your kids, they know how you clean up after yourself and pick up trash. And, and you can just, you can teach a, a year's worth of sermons in a three hour timeout golfing with a student because they just see how you treat people and, and how you live. So that's number one, intimacy. A second one I would say is everybody gets to play. I mean, it's kind of like small school sports, right? Nobody gets cut from the team. <laughs> everybody makes the team. And so that means they get to serve. We don't have a tech team unless the young people serve. We don't get to have worship teams unless you get young people involved. And so get them involved in every kind of ministry you have at your church, you know, your men's ministry, your women's ministry, your evangelism, all of them, they can be just as involved as every other member. They're involved in the nursery. So I think 
they're part of the church and they learn how to serve. So that, that's a huge strength. And then I think finally intergenerational ministry is because you have to do intergenerational ministry. Again, it goes back to the serving. They are rubbing shoulders with the adults and serving in nursery or serving in tech. And they learn how to talk to adults. A lot of rural churches, we don't have a separate youth wing. We can't afford a separate youth wing. <laughs> um, and I don't think that's all bad. I'm not against the youth wing. I'm not against, again, I love pizza. I love games. I'll do that with the best of them. It's a blast. But sometimes we need to get them in with everybody else. So I think those three for me, uh, relational intimacy, getting involved, and then the intergenerational piece. I think those are three real strengths that the rural church has. Kyle, those are incredibly helpful and so affirm what is going on in so many student ministries. And I'm so thankful for that because often when you contrast rural ministry with the mega ministry, really the value and those assets of rural ministry are really discarded. So what would be your encouragement for the youth leader or the youth pastor who finds himself out there, who's just been thrust into student ministry with no training, no background, and they're just trying to make sure the kids are safe and do some entertainment with the kids for an hour or two a week. What would be your encouragement to them? Remember your mandate, make disciples. That's it. Make disciples and then do it in a way that makes sense. I don't know what that's going to look like for you. It might be running a traditional youth group. And if that's it, well, praise God. If that's what he, the best way you can reach people in your context, then go ahead and do that. If it's training parents, train those kids, do that. If it's doing one-on-one, do that. If it's starting up, a, I don't know, a sports ministry to reach out in your community, then do that. Whatever it is, make disciples. And I think that's, that's the biggest takeaway, no matter where you find yourself. I love that freedom. That was a kind of a key word a little bit ago that you brought up. We're free to do youth ministry the way that God has positioned us and called us to do it. And I think that's encouraging. Kyle, we want to thank you so much for sharing with us what you've been learning about discipling young people. Thanks, brother. Yeah, thank you guys. appreciate being on. We oftentimes look at a rural, small community and assume it's missing resources. But as it pertains to the church, a tight-knit community has a gold mine at its fingertips because that built-in intimate setting fosters strong relationship building. And people are starving for a relationship, especially teens. A thriving youth group is essential. For resources and ideas on improving the outreach at your church, the Appalachian Ministry Institute is ready to help. Tri-State Bible College and the Appalachian Ministry Institute exist as a resource. And no matter what need you may have, Rex Howe and Dr. Matt Shamblin want you to reach out to them today. Rex Howe is the president of Tri-State Bible College, and you can contact him by email at rex.howe at tsbc.edu. And you can reach out to Dr. Matt Shamblin at the Appalachian Ministry Institute by email matt.shamblin at tsbc.edu. The Level Paths Podcast is an outreach of Tri-State Bible College and the Appalachian Ministry Institute.